Cranky, what's all the screaming? Right then, it's high time I ripped the band-aid off, huh? But seriously, I've wanted to talk about the Donkey Kong Country cartoon for years now, and nowadays I feel like I can do it proper justice. And I'm also slowly becoming the Canadian cartoon spokesman around here, so this'll fill my CanCon and Donkey Kong quotas. Kill two Neckies with one crystal coconut. Most of you probably know about this show already, and if this is your first time watching someone talk about it, well, I'd call you a liar. I'm not the first guy to do so, and I won't be the last, but like with everything I make, I'm putting putting my own spin on it. I'll bring up some of the obvious bits and my two cents on them, but you won't find a retrospective out there quite like mine. Whether you like it, well, that's a different story. With Donkey Kong Country Mania in full swing during the 90s, DK was on top of the world, and with any mega hit video game, you branch out to really rake in the big bucks. A tried and true avenue was getting a TV show, and DK joined the big boy ranks with a show of his own. Saturday Supercade comes close, but not quite. The DKC cartoon hit the airwaves in 1996, first airing in France and trailing out to other parts of the world in the following years. America didn't see this till 98 when it aired on Fox Family, which, from my perspective, seemed like a dumping ground for Canadian fare and didn't really set the world on fire. Fox Kids showed it once or twice, but only as a special airing during holiday breaks. Back in Canada, it debuted a year earlier, making its home on Teletoon. Some say that was our Cartoon Network, before we got hit with American Synergy, but there was more to it than that, especially early on. I mean, we had a late night block four years before Adult Swim was a thing, but I digress. When Teletoon came out the door as Canada's animation Station, DKC was one of its launch shows for both the English feed and the French feed Teletoon. Yes, there is a difference. The show was a groundbreaking achievement in animation, being the first TV series done primarily with motion capture, which kind of parallels how the DKC games were groundbreaking for their 3D technology. And like the first DKC game, this show is one of the earliest shows I recall seeing as a child. I have faint memories of five-year-old me watching this at 5.30 in the morning, and I came in with no expectations. I was just happy seeing DK and friends talking and dancing around. You can still find the show's page on Teletoon's old website via the Wayback Machine, and even a few online rips taken directly off the channel. I still get giddy seeing that old smiling face in the corner cause I probably saw this on TV. But enough reminiscing for now, I also wanted to learn how this show came about, and some of the answers are in a 1998 book called Computer Animation, A Whole New World. I'll just skim over the Donkey Kong stuff for now. France-based studio Media Lab got the rights from Nintendo to make a Donkey Kong show, and teamed up with Canadian studio Nelvana to get it done. These two actually worked together before. If you remember sticking around, that was their doing, and they did pretty good, for your big fat information. Their first hurdle was translating the Donkey Kong world to a TV format. They beefed up the personalities of the characters, and for the show's look, they focused on their exaggerated anatomy. One aspect being, quote, oversized heads and chests, and looking at the old DKC renders, well, they got that down pat. This character sheet from 95 shows they even had the animal buddies in mind, and I'm really digging these drawings. Some of the show's storyboards have also cropped up online, and they have a great style too. A few drawings even snuck their way into the show, and one episode has a 2D shadow for Crusha. It's nice they managed to salvage some of that work. 70% of the animation was done via mocap, with things like vine swinging being done traditionally, though the mocap came with a lot of restrictions. One writer said new locations and characters were highly discouraged, though they still wanted the show to feel big and expansive. Characters couldn't pick up objects either. Holding things was okay, but actually picking them up was off the table, and anything to do with water, forget about it. Designs were subject to this too. Dixie's hair had to be trimmed down, and K. Rule's cape interfered with the animation, resulting in it looking like a bib. And is that also why he doesn't have a tail? Every other Kremlin that doesn't use his model has one, and it's always bothered me. He looks like a frogman. Funky Kong also has no clothes, and I seem to be the only one who has has an issue with that. I also had the good fortune of getting in touch with the show's director, Mike Fallows, and he oversaw pretty much everything. Scripts, storyboards, recording, modeling, post-production, all that stuff. Before this show, he was aware of Donkey Kong, but never played it. Whether that was the arcade games or Donkey Kong Country, I'm not sure. I was curious how he got involved with the show, and Mike had this to say. I got involved with Donkey Kong when Nelvana got involved in the project. The project was in trouble and needed to have someone with my experience to come 
come in and get it back on track. I was one of the few at Nelvana at the time with some computer experience and it was being produced at Media Lab in Paris. I also had experience working with French studios. I was originally hired to go over to Paris to get the project back on track, not to direct it. There was already a French director on the project at the time. A month or so in and I was asked by Nelvana and Media Lab to take over the project as director. Now what kind of trouble was the show in, you ask? Well, I know of one story. When Novana came on board, 13 scripts were already done, but Media Lab fired the original writers. Why? Because what they wrote was not only god-awful, but filled with racist and sexist jokes. Yeah, I, I don't understand it either. I'm sure that's when Media Lab said, let's get guys who specialize in kids programming, that seems like a safe bet. Thing is, 10 of those scripts were already storyboarded, so to save money, Nelvana was forced to write new stories around the old drawings. That sounds like a nightmare, and eight of those episodes were written by one person. I can't imagine she slept well during this time, if at all. And it explains a lot about season one. I've watched a few episodes in the past, but this is my first time watching the show front to back, and the early stuff felt really weird. Stories and dialogue were super clunky, things happened for no reason, plot points were unresolved. Watching it, I thought, Thought, this show ain't perfect, but I don't remember it being actually bad. Hearing what happened behind the scenes though, I gotta give kudos to the team for making lemonade with such cursed lemons. That nugget of info came from head writer Erica Strobel, who said Donkey Kong was one of her favorite gigs at Nelvana, and she worked on Dog City for dog's sakes. She posted this on the show's retro junk page in the mid 2000s, alongside a couple other production tidbits. She also said Funky was her favorite character, closely followed by Clump and Cap and scurvy, though she despised Candy Kong for reasons we'll get into, but it's assuring to hear even the staff didn't like her. If you're expecting something resembling the games, you'll probably be let down. This is a very, very loose adaptation. No Donkey Kong Country music, no sound effects, the Kremlings are called lizards, crocs, anything but Kremlings really. Funky still flies planes and Diddy stomps on his hat a couple times, but that's really it for direct references. And they don't live on Donkey Kong Island either. Rather Congo Bongo, and I have no idea why. It doesn't keep me up at night anymore, but was DK Island too egotistical or something? The cast is made up of the Kong family and some Kremlings from the first game, with a few original characters sprinkled in. I like the idea of some of these guys, but how they're executed, it's hit and miss. Clump and Crusha being singular characters, I, I kinda like that, but Eddie the Mean Old Yeti and Bluster Kong, nah, they're dumb. There's also this parrot called Polly Roger, and it will always bother me that he's not Screech from DKC2. Speaking of, Dixie Kong made the cut, the only thing outside the first game to do so. Though, to be fair, DKC3 wasn't out when this show dropped. She also has this trait of keeping crustaceans as pets, but you never actually see them, likely due to the aforementioned limitations. Still, if you ask Dixie, you're fond of me lobster, ain't you? She won't hesitate, but you'll just have to take her word for it. And I don't want to rag on the animation because it's a miracle they got this out the door, but Dixie never looked right. And it's mainly her eyes, man. Those pupils have a mind of their own. Yeah, we've all heard the jokes about Funky being a stoner, but Dixie looks like she's on acid half the time. Just had to get that off my chest. Somehow I got this far into the video without going over the show's plot, but simply put, one day DK stumbled upon the all-powerful crystal coconut in the temple of Inca Dinka Do. God, I hate that name. And the relic deemed him future ruler of Congo Bongo. Until that day comes, the Kongs have to protect the coconut from K. Rule, or K. Rule as the show pronounces it, or anyone else a little power hungry that week. If DK's not screwing around or eating bananas, it usually goes back to the coconut. Most plots center around guarding it, someone stealing it, or stealing it back, straight up giving it to the enemy. It's like a high stakes game of hot potato. And it's hilarious cause the Kongs have no real way to guard this thing. They have some traps lying around, but no locks on the doors or windows. Usually the Kremlings just walk into Cranky's hut and take it. Anyone can bust in here if they want, even Eddie the mean old Yeti, and I'm sure no one gave him the address. Anyway, what can this coconut do? Well, whatever it needs to, really. Turn you invisible, heal wounds, astral projection, I'm sure if it was plot relevant, it could make you a sandwich. Going over the characters more, they take some getting used to. Some feel more in line with their game counterparts than others, but 
as a unit, things are much different. In the games, they're a family, willing to risk their lives for each other at the drop of a hat. Episode 2 has Cranky held hostage, Diddy sees it from outside and he's like, nah bro, I'm out, not my problem. Other times, they just barely tolerate each other. They're one bad day away from stabbing somebody, I swear. The worst offender is Candy Kong. I don't like her here at all. She's always complaining and getting upset for the pettiest of things, especially at DK. The minute he's not the perfect boyfriend, she casts him aside like trash. I don't know what DK sees in her. But you want some prime dysfunctional family antics? That's in Kong for a day. K. Rule frames DK into looking like a jerk, and they all take it at face value, giving him no chance to explain himself. And when Cranky thinks DK dismantled his house, his sole evidence being a banana peel on the floor, he exiles him to the mountains for life. A sentence like that, you'd think he committed treason. This, alongside everything else in season one, makes it a rough watch. But with episode 14 onwards, which some say is still season one, but I'm gonna call it season two, I noticed a jump in quality like almost immediately. The writers had less restrictions now and stuff felt more in line with what I remember enjoying about the show. Side note, did you know one of the writers in here is Ian James Corlett? You know, first English voice of Goku in Dragon Ball Z, creator of the show Being Ian among a bajillion other things he's done? He was living in British Columbia while Donkey Kong was a Toronto based affair, but he told me that didn't stop him writing for shows based in Toronto and Los Angeles. Dude's always been an inspiration and his stuff here ain't too bad either. Anyway, to list some improvements, Candy's nowhere near as unlikable. Still terrifying to look at, but she's eased up on the whole irrational hatred thing. The family dynamic was a little better too. Bluster tends to get the short end of the stick most of the time, but it's Bluster, so I'm okay with that. The Kremlings also had these weird claptrap guns where they would dematerialize and ate stuff, but aside from one episode here with Junior Claptrap, they're gone for the rest of the series. Seems like they took some time to see what worked best and what didn't. But I'll tell you, one thing they nailed from the get-go was the voice acting, and most people seem to agree on that. Richard Yearwood as DK is how I imagined he would sound since I was a kid, and Ben Campbell as K. Rule? No complaints from me, he is a delight. Clump's pretty great too, I always thought he had some of the best lines in the whole show. Oh, mother of mercy to my car going 90, we're gonna be fried fixing tonight. What's a groany? Oh, it's a derogatory term used to describe heathen henchmen like ourselves who reside in the lowest level of authority. He's delightfully voiced by Adrian Truss, who I knew best growing up as Poe from Ruby Gloom. Something oddly adorable about that. Another highlight is Aaron Tager is cranky. He's got the right amount of gravel in his voice, great range and energy, and he kind of sounds like Gilbert Gottfried when he gets really mad. I'm for the dim witted scatterbrain crazy things DK has ever done. This is the limit. Will you shut your pie hole and get going already? Doing research, I also learned Tager was an accomplished visual artist. Man, what a talent he was. For a long time, I also didn't know Crusha was voiced by Len Carr. Carlson, and this guy had a legendary VO career. He was the original Green Goblin in the 60s Spider-Man cartoon, Hugo in Street Fighter 3, Burt Raccoon in the Raccoons, he did it all. Dare I say he was the Canadian Mel Blanc, and according to Raccoons creator Kevin Gillis, he might have filled in for Mel for a Porky Pig gig once. Interesting, if true. So yeah, he plays Crusha here whose dialogue is pretty limited, but he gets a few moments to shine, namely in episode 14. Crusha gets hit on the head and gets smart, going from sounding like Bebop and Rocksteady to a more articulate, calculated villain. Carlson, of course, knocks it out of the park, and the man even gets his own song, and I unironically loved it. I like evil, lovely evil. I like evil so much I could scream. There's so much joy in planning my next diabolical scheme. <laughs> That's a good enough segue to talk about the show's music, arguably the most notable thing about it. It was all done by Toronto musicians Paul Kaufman and Tim Foy at their studio, Pure West. From the background music to every single lyrical 
musical song. To go back to Erica Strobel, she said the musical numbers were Media Lab's idea, and like the rest of us, she was very confused by that decision. Maybe it was a way to show off more of that mocap technology by having them dance? Th that's my best guess. But I'll give it to them, they did a good job. They got catchy lyrics, covered a lot of genres, and there's some fun references for older viewers or pop culture fanatics like myself. Most episodes have two songs each, with 76 of them spread across the 40 episode run. 10% of them are in the Crystal Coconut VHS tape. Y you know what? I'm shocked they didn't put out any albums of this. And if you happen to be a fan of Disney's The Ghost and Molly McGee, you'll notice they took a page or two from DK. They got two songs an episode covering multiple genres, except those ones are better woven into the plot, but don't tell me they didn't look at DK for inspiration. I, I see you. Most of the BGM is from Nelvana's own sound libraries, including a lot of the song instrumentals. Big Bog Monster uses a track called Haunted Funhouse from the album Big Top Adventure. Sped up parts and everything. I'm guessing some of these were done with Donkey Kong in mind, but you can find most of them online, presumably for your own projects. Side note, I found one track that was used in the show 16 a lot, and if you know it, your mind will instantly go to Jonesy and Jude sneaking around in air vents. No need to thank me. If some of these tracks predate the show, it's even more impressive they made songs with them that people are still singing decades later. And you know, shows like Spongebob do the exact same thing. The Now That We're Men song, which played in a big budget blockbuster, mind you, used a stock track, so you know what, Donkey Kong gets a pass. Also want to spotlight the amazing guitar solo in the theme song. That was done by a guy named Justin Deneau, a band teacher at my old Toronto high school, though I never met him myself. And I can't forget to bring up DK's singing voice, Sterling Jarvis, and we all know it, he's phenomenal. Look at me, I can dance so gracefully. Gotta have some rhythm just to make the scene. He's got a voice that makes teenage girls cry and grown men weep, though strangely he's uncredited here. I've seen people say this is the only thing he's ever done, and that shows how many people look into these things. He's done a little bit of everything, TV, commercials, stage productions. He was in the Toronto production of The Lion King where he was Pumbaa and Simba. And I saw that when I was seven, and I might have seen him without even knowing it. If you ever watched Zaboomafu, he also sang the theme song, and Pure West did that show's music too. No wonder I still remember those songs word for word. But wait, it gets wilder. I have a cousin, Alana Bridgewater, she's a singer, performer, and if you played Cuphead, you might know her as King Dice or through some of the songs she sang in the game. She's also close friends with Jarvis, and I'll let her speak for herself for a second. We we're actually really, really close, really good friends. Yeah. And he was just doing um, a Book of Mormon in New York City on Broadway. Oh, and cool. his daughter has followed in his footsteps, and she's going to be appearing in Alice in Wonderland at Soul Pepper. Her name's Aisha Jarvis. One of the bands that I'm, I sing with is called Digging Roots, and Aisha mm -hmm. replaced me because I was doing way too many things um, yeah. in the band and just got, came back from South Africa and Paris. So she's getting the opportunity <laughs> to travel and do her crafts. And it's really great to see the, you know, the next generation coming up. I wasn't lying when I said you'd get some unique perspectives on this show, was I? For those curious on my favorite songs, they include Big Bog Monster, Monkey Business, Eddie Let Me Go Back to My Home, Road to Success, Booty Boogie. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of them. With all that out of the way, I wanted to talk about season 3 for a bit, cause the show had a little shake up here. After 26 episodes, a year or so went by and Media Lab's rights expired, with Nelvana getting them soon after. Fox ordered another season, and the animation this time was done by Chinese studio Hong Guang. I honestly can't say if this looks better or worse, but I prefer the look of the first two seasons. The lighting is more impressive, but some of these textures and colors are pretty ugly, but you know, I did get used to it. Mike Fallows told me this season was done entirely through keyframe animation rather than mocap, and I say it animates a lot nicer. There's great character acting, and stuff has a good weight to it, and the lip sync, which was all over the place before, is near perfect here. And while I said the voice acting was great before, everyone knows their characters pretty well now. And you can tell they're having a blast. They even note how ridiculous Banana Slamma is as a catchphrase, and I accepted it as just a weird thing Donkey Kong says. Probably cause it makes him happy. If I ever see you in my territory again, 
I'm gonna banana slammer you like you've never been banana slammer before. The finale is called Message in a Bottle Show, and if you didn't know, which I didn't before researching, a bottle episode is one made on the cheap with only the core characters and settings, like a clip show, which is what this is. It's one of the better ones too, a send off slash roast for Donkey Kong before he leaves Congo Bongo to do bigger things. It showcases the cartoon's strong points, mainly Media Labs episodes, and Cranky tells DK that he loves him like a son, and, and they even share a hug. I really liked this. And then it all gets undone when they find out the letter wasn't addressed to Donkey Kong, but Monkey Kong, and everyone's like, ah, oh, we wasted our time. Before 2023, I would have said, who the heck is Monkey Kong? But uh, Keenan Thompson has the answer, apparently. M mon who's Monkey Kong? He's a donkey. <laughs> Now, when talking about lasting impact and legacy, this show did so in ways some folks could have never imagined, myself included. When asking Mike Fallows if he had any memories from working on DKC, he said once it got off the ground it was a lot of fun to make, and many friends made back then remain friends today. Also, working with early mocap helped set up for another show he directed, Jane and the Dragon. That blew my mind, I remember that show very well. He also loved the show's music and recording and animating for all the songs. It can also be argued elements from the show found their way back into the games. In DK64, Cranky took up science, which I can kinda see, but Crystal Coconuts, plural, showed up there too, and later in King of Swing and Barrel Blast. And Banana Slamma somehow found its way into the Switch port of Tropical Freeze. It, I kinda dig that. Though it wasn't crazy popular in North America during its initial run, the story was a bit different in other places. Japan, for example, went bananas for this. They got an all-star cast for their dub, a new intro and ending which even showed up in Donkey Konga 3, rental tapes, CDs, toys, manga, even a trading card game that later tied in with, again, DK64. It was partly manufactured by Rare 2, which means someone over there knew about Bluster. In its native France, the Media Lab models were used in ads for DKC2 and 3, but glossed up models of DK did Clump, Crusha, and Rambi showed up in a US ad for DKC on Game Boy Color. Media Lab also had a side series called Planet Donkey Kong slash DKTV with movie spoofs and music videos, but I'm not opening that can of worms. From what I've seen though, it's way more bizarre than the show. Of course, I gotta mention those amazing fan animations by Canadian animator Alex Henderson and his crew. There was 2021's music video to Ailstorm's Pirate Scorn cover, which on its own was amazing, but putting them together still has me geeking out. He even got the detail of Cranky's cane opening the coconut, that is true devotion. And let's not forget 2023's Return to Crocodile Isle, a 10 minute epic that reunites some of the show's voice cast after 20 something years. None of them miss a beat, K. Rule gets an all new song, and his tail, this was a dream come true. I'd love to see a Donkey Kong show like this one day, but none of this would have happened if the original wasn't there, so no doubt it's important. And there's so many ways to watch it now, it's disgusting. There's iTunes and some DVDs, but Nelvana's had it up on three YouTube channels in the past for free, with two still up and about. You could get the Crystal Coconut VHS tape too, which fun fact has different packaging and opening trailers in the Canadian release. A friend of mine brought this over once and never asked for it back, so uh, thanks I guess. I say if you go into this with the right mindset, you'll enjoy something about it. It's an ambitious show with genuine talent and left a positive impact on a lot of people. That's enough for me to say, you know what? You did good Donkey Kong. You did good. Thanks so much for watching everybody, I really hope you enjoyed what you saw. First and foremost, I want to give a big special thanks to Mike Fallows, not just for sharing his stories, but also helping getting the Donkey Kong cartoon out the door. You did a bunch of other good stuff too, but if Donkey Kong is your legacy, I'd say that's pretty good, so again, thanks for everything. And if you guys enjoyed this, feel free to give it a like, a share, subscribe, and if you want to support me more directly, check out my Patreon. You'll get to see videos just like this one before they go public, and your name in the credits along with a shout out. Speaking of, I'd like to extend my thanks today to Lars Niswant and Mystica Bell for their support. It means more than you know, guys. As for what's next for the Donkey Kong Marathon, well, I won't say it just yet, but I'm sure it'll drum up some excitement, so just keep your eyes peeled, alright? And with all that said, I'll see you guys next time. Later!